Class Airport is an American aviation story. Its remarkable history has been chronicled through a series of oral history interviews. We're speaking with Wynn Turney, Commissioner of the Kentucky Department of Aviation. Commissioner Turney also holds his pilot's license, is involved with the Aviation Museum of Kentucky, and previously served on the Lexington Fayette Urban County Airport Board. Wynn, tell us about yourself. I am the Commissioner for the Department of Aviation for the State of Kentucky, which means I run the state airports. I help maintain them and things like that. Uh, my connection with the airport probably started back in the late 60s when I started flying, taking flying lessons, but I'd always been interested in the airport, so that's where, that's where it started. And then I was on the board here from 74 to 79, so we, I was in, that was in the time when we were actually rebuilding the new terminal building. We tore down the old terminal building and we started the new one, and of course now it doesn't look like anything that it looked like then because they added on to it, it's just a beautiful facility, it really is. So that's my general connection, but I mean there are other, other things as well. But. So you were there in 1978 when the Wildcats returned from winning the NCAA. Tore up the place, literally. Yeah. Also, that was the, win the winner of discontent because uh, I believe it was 78 and 79. We had the worst winter I can ever remember. In fact, we had just hired a new airport manager from, I think, Wisconsin or in that area. And he asked us, he said, uh, how many inches of snow do you all have? I think the average then was 4.2 or something like that. We had 53 inches of snow that year, and the next year we had 48 inches of snow, so it was a, it was a bad winter. So, but yeah, that was the 78 Wildcats when they kind of, the fans kind of acted up a little bit and left the place kind of a mess, frankly. They were waiting for the team to come back, and then they, they literally stormed the place, and they were, they were standing on things and everything, so it was just a, of course everybody was very happy and they weren't really worried about it at the time, but then Afterwards, it was just a clean up, and it wasn't that bad. But they were a very, ha very happy group, believe me. So the airport terminal was pretty new at that point. See, Governor Carroll was the governor at the time, and so we had the formal opening, and I can't remember the exact date, but it was actually in 76 when it opened up, I believe. Uh, I want to say April or May in that area. Um, the old airport, uh, which you're probably not even familiar with, I don't know that you are, but it was something to behold. It had it was circular inside and had huge pictures of things in Kentucky, huge tobacco fields, huge, of course, horses and also cows, and it was quite interesting. Uh, that airport was uh, under the management of a fellow named Logan Gray at that time. He was a manager, quite a fellow himself. He was known for the red carpet treatment at Bluegrass Airport. He literally would put out a red carpet when people disembarked from the cabins of the aircraft and came out and stepped into the red carpet to greet them. And so that was the theme for the airport, where you get the red carpet treatment with Logan. Unfortunately, Logan did not see the new terminal building. He had a heart attack, I believe, in 1975 and passed away. But it was very sad that he could not have seen what, what came after he, after he left us. But it was, a, it was a wonderful time then. We needed the new terminal building so bad. We had a lot of support. Uh, it was something that uh, we worked very hard for. Uh, I know that a couple of board members and I worked on special things with the airport. Uh, one to get somebody to run the restaurant, also someone to run the park, run a parking concession, and that was one of the things that uh, the fellow named Irv Scribner, who was a dentist and one of our fellow board members, we worked very hard on that. And we both also worked on the GA side, the general aviation side, more so than in the other other members. That was our assignment to do that. I was vice chairman for that particular. General Aviation Committee. So, but we enjoyed our work. It was a lot of fun. It was, there was a lot of things going on. It was a, only a board. There were only six members on the board at that time. So it was a smaller board. Uh, we got a lot of work done and done very quickly. We had uh, good people on board. So we really enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun. Was Garvis Kincaid on the airport board at that time? He left the board. That was uh, at that point in time. There were some problems with the board, and they had to do some re reappointing of people on there. And I think the board member that I replaced, I believe his name was White at the time. And this was, 19, see, I was appointed in November of 74. And then that's when my board, my, uh, my little, uh, I guess you want to call it term, and it expired at a certain time. And then I was replaced due, due to politics, frankly. That's what happens here. You have a new mayor come in, and he has other people he wants to put on the board. You know, you did a good job, but goodbye kind of thing. And that was fine. It worked out okay. But yes, that was during the Garvis Kincaid, that era, it sure was. 
he was, of course, the, the big bank mogul, and uh, he was on the board, and there were some problems with, I think, some contracts or things they decided they, they shouldn't be on the board. When did you become interested in airplanes? Well, I lived on a farm in Bourbon County, and I can actually remember way back, this really does date me, I can remember formations of bombers and fighters flying over, and this was in the, in the mid-40s, so I was probably six or seven, six years old probably. Uh, my, also, my uncle, actually they were, our, both these guys were our cousins, but they were older, so we called them uncle, uh, opened a small airport in Paris, uh, just a grass field airport. And uh, we would go out there on Sundays and just sit and watch the airplanes. I would literally lay down on the one end of the runway and let the, watch the planes come over top of me and fly. And so I got my first ride when I was about 11 years old in a, in a J3 Cub. And I guess when you're flying about 70 miles an hour and just about 1,000 feet in the air, you really get a good perspective of, of how pretty everything is. So I really got my bug then. And both my, my dad was in the Air Force, Air Corps. Uh, he didn't fly, but he learned to fly later on. My mother took flying lessons. She never got her license. So it was kind of a bug, yeah, and I enjoyed it. I just love airplanes, always have. Did the airstrip in Paris have a name? No, it was just the Paris airport, and it only lasted for about two years because the, the uncles that ran it were uh, Doug and Bill Wilson, and Bill, his brother, was killed in a plane crash in New York. And right after that, it just the whole place, it just closed up. And what's interesting about that, if you go around Paris now on the bypass, going around and come back out near the Nosberg Road, there's a farm right there, and if you look real closely, you can still see an old tea hanger there. And that tea hanger ho uh, housed a, what they call a bamboo bomber. That was a Cessna aircraft that my uncle had at that time. And that, that's still there. They've left it there for some reason. And the rest of the, of the strip is now where the, air, the hospital is. So that was a long time, off of East Greek Lane. So that's where, I, where my bug came. That's where I got to fly the first time. Did you have any aviation mentors or idols? Well, I think we all have some sort of idols. Uh, I did learn from, my, I guess, my Uncle Doug. Doug was the one. He, uh, he was a ferry pilot during World War II. He also flew for a local construction company, Hinkle Construction, which still exists. I think it has been bought out, but for the original uh, fellow who ran it. And so Doug was a corporate pilot for them. He flew all the time. And so I really kind of got it from him and from my dad a little bit. And that's where I started anyway. So, and then I had, you know, everybody has their, you know, one of my favorites now, of course, is, was Chuck Yeager. I've met him a couple of times, and he is a, an interesting fellow, to say the least. I'll, and he's quite forceful, and he, he can be quite a character in his conversations with you. How does the Kentucky Department of Aviation interface with Bluegrass Airport? Well, what, what we, we try to help all the airports. We have what we call, there are 53 gen, these are general aviation airports, plus you have the commercial airports. We do as much as we can for Bluegrass, but people like Bluegrass, Cincinnati, and Louisville really have all the, they work with the FAA directly. They get most of their funds from the FAA and, and local funds. The only thing that recently the uh, department was involved with was the construction of the new runway here from 826 that went to 927. And that was a uh, project in which we put in $9 million. It was local, it was a $27 million project. Uh, nine million from the FAA, nine million locally, and nine million from the Department of Aviation. And so that was one thing that we were really involved with. Otherwise, we just try to help the smaller airports with maintenance. Uh, we help some of them with terminal buildings. We do uh, help them with runways, all in conjunction with the FAA. We, have a, we do a certain percentage. What usually happens is on a project with FAA, uh, the local people will come up with, say, 2.5%. The department will do 2.5%, then the FAA will do the rest. That may change in the future. The FAA may do less, and there'll be more that'll have to come up from the local and from the state, but we don't know how that's going to happen yet. Things are still kind of up in the air with the FAA and, and funding. So but that we just help all the other airports, and like I said, we've done everything from constructing T hangers for uh, general aviation aircraft, for terminal buildings, to helping with runways, taxiways, anything, fuel systems, things like that. When so you provide some funding and other help. Yes, we do. And we, like I said, we do, everything we do, we do conject really with the FAA and, and those projects. They, they're not involved in things like terminal buildings, but they do all the other things, and we try to do all those with them. And it's, 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 a, it's a good process, a good partnership. How well do general aviation and commercial coexist? Well, particularly at Bluegrass, it's, it's gotten really, really good. You've got TAC Air, which is a, a charter and, a, and really a GA place, a, 
and it, they have just expanded their facilities and they're just wonderful. And, and, and in conjunction with that, uh, I was, I'm was i involved with the Aviation Museum. So the Aviation Museum left their old place and moved to the, the, the their new place, which is the old place for TAC Air. And so uh, that's been a good thing for both people. I think the museum has benefited from it immensely. It's a beautiful facility, has a lot of mu much more room, much more professional looking. But GA has coexisted very well with, uh, with the rest of the airport. Uh, you know, people don't realize what GA does for their community. You know, you fly in your supplies, you fly, you, you, your shrimp that you got from someplace has just been flown in here. We fly horses in and out and things like that. Uh, it, and there's a lot of based aircraft here. I had, I had an airplane here and I had my own hangar here for a long time. And uh, of course, and I used it partially for business sometimes and par partially for pleasure. Uh, I don't know what the based aircraft is in there. I'm sure it's very big, but they've expanded more and more with the, the bigger jet aircraft that, uh, that some of the corporate people have, and that's a good thing. People look at it sometimes as being kind of a bad thing, and that kind of hurt, hurt GA for a while, and, but it's coming back again. I think it's good. Talk about changes in aviation in recent years. Well, of course, since 9-11, things, a lot of things have changed, but yes, uh, pati particularly security-wise, we have now been uh, trying to, at all our airports, you would think fencing was, you, know, you would think fencing was one thing you ought to have all the time. Well, they don't have them a lot, but fencing is the important part. We've been doing a lot of fencing projects through these airports. Also, some airports are trying to get their uh, sur uh, surveillance systems up and things like that. And of course, Bluegrass has done that as well. And that's going to continue. It's not going to get any better. It's going to be a very, I can remember going out here on Bluegrass and walking my dog, having a picnic at the end of the runway, uh, things like that, which in the airport closed uh, like at nine o'clock at night, you know, and that's, uh, and that hasn't been that long ago. Uh, but it has changed everything we do, the TSA, uh, and that, that's, that's every place, and it's a little hard to swallow sometimes, but uh, considering what they're doing or why they're doing it, yeah, you have to do it, you know, and that's not a problem with me. I, th I think it's a good thing. It's caused things to be a little difficult for some flying passengers, uh, but they all get through it. Uh, and I think TSA is getting better as they go, too. There's been some problems with them. But, and you said structurally, well, uh, obviously this structure has, uh, has grown and grown and grown, which is good for the uh, general public. Uh, it's a beautiful facility. It's one of the prettiest airports you'll ever see. I mean, just it's uh, a brick and mortar thing is absolutely gorgeous. I can remember flying in here one time and I looked, I was going over, the, coming in over, over the Versailles Road, and I just realized how pretty this whole approach is to this airport. It's a beautiful approach, and you can't find that in a lot of airports. So we're very lucky in that we've got what we have here. It's a wonderful airport. Uh, it's been run particularly well now, I think. So I think it's in good hands. I think it's gonna, it, it moves with the, what has to happen in the future. And I think they're kind of ahead of the, ahead of the game here. And so I'm really impressed with what they're doing here. It's a, I have a love for this airport, and I think it's just done really, really well. As a pilot, how do you compare Bluegrass Airport with other airports? It's one of the easiest ones to approach. Uh, and when you land, it's one of the friendliest airports you'll ever come to. And that, that's important. People come to even Capital City Airport where over in Frankfurt. And of course, that's when a lot of people first have their connection with Kentucky as they do when they come into Lexington at Bluegrass. And particularly when you're coming into the Capitol, you want, and these people are coming in for business and things like that, you want to be, we have a, a staff over there who runs the airport, which we get so many compliments on because we you know, they try to help them find places to eat, take them to, to their motels and things like that. And that's very important. And a lot of small airports do that. And Capital City is a small airport compared to Bluegrass. But as far as Bluegrass is concerned, I still like it better than Louisville and, and better than uh, Cincinnati, just for those reasons. It's smaller. It's got just an easy approach to it. Uh, the people are very friendly. Not that those in Cincinnati and Louisville aren't, but it's just, it's, it's a nice airport to come to. You feel comfortable when you come to Lexington. Um, well, Bluegrass Airport used to be little, little, and it's, it's not anymore. It's, it's grown, and it's grown very well. When tell us about your military service. I was in the Army for three years. Uh, I was in, actually in missiles. I was not in, uh, although I got a, a, another feeling that I, when I initially went in, I thought I might get into helicopters. I didn't, and that's probably just as well, because at that time they were just beginning to send advisors to Vietnam. I was in from 59 to 62, and uh, I enjoyed I needed service. It was good for me. The discipline was great. I enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun. I was good at it. Uh, 
thought about going to, to get a commission and did everything but go before the board in, in Columbus, Ohio, and then decided that, you know, well, I've got 11 months to go and I have to take six months of OCO, or they call it C, uh, officers, o OCT, and then I have two years active duty. I thought, well, no, I don't want to do that. So then I went, I decided to go back to school. So, but I enjoyed my service. It was fun. I went to Texas and shot missiles and all sorts of crazy things like that. And they don't make them anymore. That shows you how obsolete I am. What were some of your accomplishments when you were on the airport board? Yeah, I would say there was. I would say the terminal, of course, was the first one. I mean, we needed it. Uh, it looked great. I would say the second one was, and I, I'll mention uh, Dr. Scrivener's name again. Uh, he and I worked on two particular projects at that time. One was to get a, a restaurant here. We flew down to a couple places. Finally, got a fellow named Nick Rutzes to come in and open the first restaurant here. And it did very well. And I would say the other major accomplishment is one that still exists today, and that is we, meeting Irv Scriver and I, met with a couple of parking concession people in different companies and had Republic Parking come in. And a fellow by the name of, believe it or not, Ronald McDonald uh, was a young fellow at the time, about our age, and he, uh, I think he came up with $168,000 that he had his company give us to make, make the first parking lot out here. And if my, I don't know for sure, but of course Republic Parking is still here. And my guess is, and I'm probably not too far wrong, is that it, if it isn't the most, let's say, prolific revenue maker other than the airlines, I'd be surprised. I'd be, it, it might be the, be the best revenue maker right now as opposed to the airlines, or it might be second. So I know, so I felt good about that and Irv felt good about that. We did that. And that. In those days, you didn't do bids and things. You just talked to the people and got the best one to come in and do it for you. And so it's been a very good thing for the airport. So I think Republic Parking has done a great job. So I think that was a very major accomplishment because it's a good revenue maker. Can you talk about the public safety training associated with the airport? Uh, you've got, you talked about the training. Uh, They've got some of the best crash rescue training in, in the world here. In fact, uh, they, people from all over the, the state come here and also out of state come here for this crash training. They've got a facility set up there where you have like an aircraft that's on fire and they, have, they can control it and they do that. And that's, been, that's, that's well known throughout the United States for sure. And then of course just the rental, regular crash rescue, they, they built a new building for that. I can't even remember that. Uh, right after I think I left the board, they improved that facility. And so they are very adept about what happens, what they can do when, when an aircraft crashes, as it, as it happened with the 5191 crash. So uh, I think that's one of the best things they've done here as far as that, they, about training concern. Talk about the trend to go to regional carriers. I think that's probably one of the problems if you look at what's happening at Cincinnati, CBG. Uh, they've lost so much traffic up there. Uh, that was, of course, based on the fact that Delta was, the major, was their hub then. It's no, no longer the hub anymore. In fact, I think the hub now for that probably is now Detroit. Uh, if you've gone to Cincinnati lately, you will see that it is quite sad. You walk in the buildings and there's nobody around. The escalators are closed down. It's a, it's a real sad situation. And what they're trying to do is kind of what you said. They're trying to find more regional uh, air, airline people to come in. They just need to because they, they just don't have the traffic. Uh, and it's hard right now because the airliner, the airlines are, are, some of them are losing money. A lot of them, about, I think it was just America that just uh, declared bankruptcy, if I'm right. Uh, it's very tough right now. And of course, we see that in the fees that are being charged to everybody, everything from getting a pillow, I believe, to, to uh, taking your luggage on board. They're trying to do what they can to uh, make a profit and keep themselves floating. And I see that trend to continue with the regional type and, and the, the aircraft that they use. Most of them use anywhere from 77 passenger to a maybe 110 passenger. And that's what you're going to see from now on, I think, from now on. You know, it's going, to, it's going to be that way. And the future. You're going to find some more dropping out as they go because it's just a very difficult market right now. And with, you know, the spikes in fuel uh, consumption and fuel prices always hurts them because they buy their fuel in chunks ahead of time and they don't know what's going to happen and so they get caught short sometimes. Sometimes they get caught okay, but a lot of times they get caught short. So you're still going to have more, I think, companies that are not going to make it. They really do. It's just it's very tough out there right now. Do you miss anything related to the old days of airline travel? 
Well, I think the first thing that most everybody would probably think of, and I'm not just the only one, is the, uh, is the uh, flight attendants. Not stewardesses, flight attendants, because they are now male and female. Uh, it, it was friendlier, of course. Uh, we didn't have all the security things. Uh, like I said, even when I was flying here, we used to go out to the training area over near Midway, and we'd come in, we'd, la we'd land in formation, and we'd take off in formation, uh, do things that you can't do anymore because this is this is now a real this is a commercial airport now, and you miss things like that. And there's a lot of camaraderie back in those days that I don't think you have as much today. Uh, people who were at the airport. Some people actually lived at the airport. One fellow that it was one instructor that had a trailer on the airport, lived behind one of the buildings here. Uh, and uh, it's those kind of things that I, I miss. Uh, uh, I was one of the first people to, before I got on the airport board, we established what we call a user's committee that Logan Gray agreed to. And because we felt like the GA people weren't getting uh, a fair shake of what was going on here and, and that helped a lot because everybody finally could communicate with each other and realize that, that we both belong here, the commercial plus the GA. And so it really kind of softened it and kind of worked them in together so that we became uh, partners uh, more than you know going at each other's throats for some reason or another on the airport. So that, that helped a lot and those are things that have happened over the years. Another thing was uh, there was an or another organization called PAC, that was Pilots Association of Central Kentucky. And there was two fellows and myself, well, I was involved, but it was a fellow named Paul Shoemaker and Mark Burnett kind of organized this and, along with my help. And since then, that has kind of morphed into the KAA, which is the Kentucky Aviation Association, which includes all of Kentucky now. So that was one of the accomplishments I think was nice to have been associated with, as long as also with the museum. I've been involved with the museum from its inception. So. But uh, the fact the museum is here now and probably where it's going to be from now is really nice. It's got a wonderful facility, and so uh, it's nice to see that on the airport. And the airport uses it. They, they uh, schedule tours, uh, uh, tours with uh, scouts and school kids, and it's really a nice facility. So that has kind of changed the uh, atmosphere out here. Were you involved in the Aviation Roundtable? It was called the Aviation, the, the Aviation History Roundtable of Kentucky. That was really George Gumbert, Dr. Gumbert, who was on the board here many years, for 20-some years, and a fellow named Wendell Murphy, who was, uh, he ran uh, Avis, and myself and a few others. It was just a, a group that got together, and basically we had speakers come in, and a lot of them came to George's office. Some of them came to the Springs Motel. They came in different places because we didn't have facilities at that time. And you had uh, fellows like Paul Tibbetts, who flew the Enola Gay. Uh, we had, of course, when they, uh, when they Museum opened. We had the Doolittle Raiders, those people who flew that uh, fantastic mission. Uh, we've had a lot of those type people. Uh, Chuck Yeager came in one time, and I was lucky enough to help pick him up. And of course, uh, he's one of those kind of fellows that I asked him something like, uh, "Well, how was your flight?" And he said to me, "Well, it wasn't very good because I wasn't flying." You know, so you know, he he was coming in town for something with Ashland Oil, and they picked him up. Uh, but I've enjoyed all, everything that's happened here. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, the round table, then it morphed into the Aviation Museum, and I was involved with this, and that started really in 1978. And most of those people, uh, Bob Cole, as you mentioned before, uh, then I mentioned uh, George Gumbert, and of course Wendell passed away some years ago, but they were the, the, really the ones who started it, and then we had a core group who from there went on, and, and, and it's done very well. It finally has become the official museum of the state of Kentucky. So it, it's, a, it's a nice accomplishment, and it's a nice facility, and it's nice to preserve history like that, and that's what we're trying to do over there. And also they have the different schools they have during the summertime for the different age groups, and I hope to send my grandson this summer. So there's a lot going on over there, and it's, been, it's done a lot for aviation, it really has. How important is it to offer flying lessons? Well, right now it's extremely important because right now, because of cost, it deals with fuel and just everything else, you're finding less and less people who are flying, though, and that's a problem because in, in the future you're going to have a lot less people flying for the commercial airlines. You're not getting near as many military pilots who are coming out and going into the, the commercial side. Uh, and it's an expensive proposition. There's no doubt about it. Uh, I was lucky enough when I did it, I used my my GI Bill to, to learn to fly, and that was and it helped me a lot. In fact, they didn't do all of it, but it did, did most of it. And that, that still is available. They're, they're still now starting a GI Bill 
to use for aviation, and they haven't done that for a long time. So guys coming out can, who, who maybe didn't even fly in, in the service, can come out and get lessons uh, and get go clear up, get to instrument rating, what commercial rating, whatever they want to get. And that GI Bill will help them. Uh, and I think it's very important because I said there's a, they, I think they estimate in about 20 years we'll be about 15,000 short of pilots. So that's just, that's a lot of pilots you need to get. So I don't, I don't know what's going to happen, I don't know. But that's, that's a problem they're looking at right now. When was there any achievement in aviation that was a big moment for you? Well, not particularly as a pilot, but as just being involved in aviation, I would say the fact that uh, I would have a cite three things. Of course, uh, one would be the uh, museum, being involved with that. Uh, the other would be the organization of uh, the Kentucky Aviation Association, having been involved in that. And I think the crowning point was the fact that the governor selected me to head up the Department of Aviation, and that's probably that's the, the thing that I would look at as being the most uh, important to me and that I'm really uh, am, am happy with. Can you tell us any favorite aviation stories? Uh, Betty Mosley is a pilot well known through the Central Kentucky area. Betty, Betty has a plane called the Smitten Kitten. But she was married to a local dentist, Kent Mosley. Wonderful guy, wonderful guy. He has since passed. But Kent was a, uh, a pilot, uh, I believe he was a B-17 pilot in, in World War II. And on one of his bombing missions, uh, he was attacked by a couple of, I think, Messerschmitts. And along came a P-51 and shot, I think shot one down and scared the other ones off. And many years later, I think, at a World War II reunion, I think maybe even in England, uh, this kind of happened sometimes. So he found out who that pilot was. His last name was Peterson. And he was flying a P-51 that he had named Hurry Home Honey. And he, was, he had done that because every time his wife would send him a letter, she'd say, Hurry Home Honey. So he named his aircraft. You could do that in World War II. You could just paint things on your airplanes. And so it was Hurry Home Honey. Well, Betty has a hangar here that she keeps her airplane in, and her, and her Rolls Royce, come to think of it. Uh, and right next to it is Hurry Home Honey, the very airplane that saved her husband's life, which I think is one of the, kind of like the end of the story. So that's one of the neatest ones I've ever heard, and it's, it's very true. So I think that's pretty cool. And she is, she's a dear person. Now, if you haven't interviewed her, you've got to. Uh, she knows everybody in aviation. Uh, she's done a lot of things. Uh, she was in the, the old powder puff derby thing that they don't have anymore. Uh, but she's just a dear lady and, I've, and a dear friend of mine. I think she's just a, she'll have a lot of stories to tell you. And, and they'll all be good and they'll all be funny. So uh, another thing that, not a story, but the queen has been here a number of times. Uh, I've been happy to be involved with George Gumber, particularly, and his wife Skip, who's now also passed. That when they, when the planes came in, we would get the flight crew and take him to George's house, and we did that on a couple of occasions. And so, rather than those guys just sitting in a hotel somewhere, we took took him to the, George's house, and we had a rocking good time. Believe me, they just enjoyed having a drink and telling stories and. We did that twice with two different crews, and it was a lot of fun, and they really enjoyed it because usually they, they didn't do that. They just went to some motel and holed up for a while and waited for the queen to come back out. I also had the, uh, I was able to get on the, the, quote, queen's plane one time. Well, the queen's plane is just not like Air Force One. It's just one of the many planes that's just in the regular fleet. It's very drab inside. I think the it, it's not specially made or anything like that, like you would have for the Air Force One. So it's kind of it was very interesting to get on there and just see the Queen's plane being just one of a regular, uh, uh, they call it a transport, what the, the British uh, Air Force had. So it wasn't anything special. Just, just it was hers on when she flew it off that time. They just pulled one out of the out of the rack and put it on. She put, she flew in. It was kind of fun. Do you remember the Concorde visit? The Concorde came here in I think 1990. And uh, I was standing on the roof with George Gumbert's daughter, watch, and we were a bunch watching to come in and land. And then we got to go aboard and take a look at it. Uh, it was fantastic. It was uh, got some good pictures of that that, that came here. And of course, it's a 
tragedy when that you know, had that problem and uh, it crashed and then they just it was too expensive to run anyway but the fact that kind of put the death death knoll in it so yeah it was a beautiful aircraft just outstanding and those pilots were very friendly too but it was nice to you know there's not much room in one of those concord just it's round and you're kind of bent over but they were very gracious and uh, then there was the people from Lexington who did fly out on it but yeah we were actually standing on this roof looking at it and watching it come in and Betty Mosley speaking of her again if I remember correctly, got someone to take her plane, the smitten kitten, and kind of not really nuzzle it up to the Concorde, but just kind of put it so she could take a picture of her little plane, and here's the Concorde in the background. And I think she's got a copy of that somewhere. But she decided to do that, and I thought, that, that's Betty right there in a nutshell. But yeah, it came in. It was beautiful. It was just a beautiful aircraft. Just oh, And it landed very easily and took off very easily here. And we have 7,000 feet, if I remember off the top of my head, of runway. And that's all they needed. So... And it took off quick, and it made a, a lot of noise. A lot of beautiful noise, actually. How about the 747s? The ones that come in from the uh, Emirates, yeah, they come in. And the, some of those are the shorter 747s because uh, they a little on a full fuel day in August, it's hard to even get those things out of 7,000 feet. They'd really have 10 or 11,000 feet. But they can still get them in here. They've got a lot of thrust in those engines, and they, they have the shorter version, usually. But it's fun to watch those things come in too. We've had some, we had a C-17 come in here, the Galaxy, or C-5 Galaxy come in here, and that's a massive air for airplane. It's a, a military aircraft, kind of cargo, you know, troops, tanks, things like that. And those things are huge, but that, that came in here pretty well. And lots of times you'll see the Hercules, the 130s out of Louisville come in and do touch and goes here. They'll come in and those, that's a nice looking aircraft. Too. It's a big, it's a four engine job. So we've had some big planes in here, really have. And it, it, like I said, other than a hot, humid August day and maybe full fuel and fuel passengers, um, you can get off pretty good. Not a problem. They've had all sorts of different aircraft here. They've had B-17s, B-25s, B-24s. They come in, you know, the Collins Foundation uh, has those aircraft, and you'll, they'll bring them in for a weekend sometimes. They had, in fact, they had those planes here not too long ago. And if you want to pay enough money, <laughs> you can fly one of those planes because they're very expensive to uh up the upkeep of the fuel, I think you could fly on one of those bombers for maybe $400 for half an hour, you know, and that would be fun to do. I brought my dad and the Doug Wilson fellow I talked about up here. My dad flew on B-24s, and they had a B-24 come up one day, so I, and, and Doug had also flown one, so I brought them both up here, and they were both in their, I guess, early 80s, and uh, they both, and of course, my dad was on 24s, and he was in the 13th Air Force, Air, Air Corps that back in, in the Philippines in World War II. It's funny because I asked him about his crew and stuff one day, and he said, well, they called me Pops. I said, well, why'd they call you Pops? He says, well, son, I was 30 years old, and both my pilots were 19. I said, my goodness. So we turned over these big machines to greatest generation, 19-year-olds flying bombers. You know, it's, it's just amazing what those guys did, people of that generation did. They, are, they in fact, are the greatest generation, there's no doubt about it. Any other comments or things that we haven't touched on? Not really. I, you know, I would encourage you to talk to, and I'm sure you've already got a list of people to talk to, because obviously you're doing Betty anyway. You've, you've done Bob. Uh, I would suggest uh, Dan Hale. Uh, who was, he was with, with Delta Airlines, and I just saw him not recently. He looks about the same. To me, it's totally amazing. He was their, kind of their chief here on, in the airport. Dan, and I think it's H-A-L-E off the top of my head. And just a wonderful, nice guy. But there's so many you can talk to. And, uh, David Trapp, young David Trapp, of course. His, his father just uh, passed away about a month ago, who had wonderful stories. Uh, he flew uh, B-29s and was a, the weather reconnaissance flight before Paul Tibbetts and his crew and the Enola Gay dropped a bomb in Hiroshima. Paul Tibbetts was an interesting fellow. He, uh, he's a very quiet fellow. He's a little guy, too. Now, he's just passed away. He died at 92 about six, five or six years ago. He's very hard of hearing because he'd been around airplanes all his life, and he also ran a jet, uh, jet company in, in, uh, in either Columbus or Dayton, I forgot. So he had a hard time hearing. He had to yell at Paul. But he always felt that when he had dropped the bomb, he did what he was supposed to do. But he felt, well, if we had to invade Japan, the deaths on both sides would have 
far exceeded the problems that was caused by the bomb, you know, and so that it really probably ended up saving lives. He always felt that way. He wasn't really adamant about it, but he was very quiet about it, you know. And uh, he was a, just an interesting fellow, and uh, he, he was kind of a friend, and, uh, uh, but easygoing considering what he had, what he had done and uh, what he had to put up with early on after that happened, and even later on with people who complained about it and said, you know, you shouldn't have done it and that and all sort of things. He lived with it very well. He, he, it didn't bother him. He said, I was doing my job. I saved some lives. So he felt good about that situation. Did you meet Story Musgrave? All oh, stories. Now, there is a, there's a character. Yeah, I've known Story for many years. I got him to come here to his, uh, one of his first talks. Plus, we induct, got him to be inducted in one of our first Hall of Fames. He's one of the most interesting, and he is a character. I know there's no way else to describe him. Brilliant, no doubt. Of course, a local astronaut. And really he calls Lexington his home. Uh, he has so many degrees. I think, he, I, I don't know how many degrees he's got. He's flown every kind of aircraft you can imagine. But he's a funny guy. He's, he, like I said, he's a character, but he's a really funny guy. Uh, and funny haha, not funny weird, you know. Uh, uh, a joy to be around. He just loves everybody, loves to talk. Uh, of course, he, he worked on the Hubble. He helped, he helped to, uh, on the, uh, he went up on the, I forgot which one, which flight it was, and uh, worked on the uh, Hubble telescope and got it fixed and corrected. So he has a lot of stories to tell. Uh, he, uh, it's interesting, he started flying here at Air Associates, which was the place I flew out of, about the same time that I started. However, he went a lot of hell farther than I went. <laughs> I mean, he ended up in space, you know. Good guy, though. Good guy. A lot of fun to meet. You can't help but enjoy him. Everything he says, of course, it's smart as the devil, you know. He just, he's brilliant to that extent. But he can be funny and brilliant at the same time, so you, you, have, to, you have to watch him. You just have to watch him. He's just a, he's just a character, but lovable. I'm glad, I'm glad we had him. Any other thoughts, when? Right after the airport, new new airport opened, Delta came in and they put in a jetway. And I think it was $182,000, whatever it was. It was a very expensive thing to do. And very shortly thereafter, a flight came in, I believe, from Cincinnati. And you know what a jetway is. It comes right up to the cabin door, gets you right in the terminal. A lady did not want to get off the aircraft because she knew she wasn't in Lexington. She was of the old ilk where you walked out of the cabin, down the stairs, and got the red carpet treatment from Logan Gray. She did not believe she was in Lexington. And this is a true story. So finally, they had to convince her and show her she was in Lexington. So that just shows you how, how the airport had, had grown at that time, period. And it, uh, I've forgotten who, the, who it was. It was on a Delta flight. But it was just funny. She wouldn't get off. She would. I'm not in Lexington. This is the way you get off at Lexington. They finally brought her off and showed her where she was. 